Uh, in your bulletins on the insert is the upcoming <coughs> events that are going around on here, and you can read through those. Our Wednesday Night Live is starting back up again. Um, we took a break off because of the MEA stuff uh, that the teachers do, and sometimes parents like to go and do things. And so, um, but we're we're back on, and uh, it's it's obviously a big week for kids. You know, Halloween is is right around the corner, so. Um, so that's coming up. Next Sunday is our All Together Sunday. Um, we want to, our volunteers get a break upstairs and they come down and they worship with us and the kids kind of show us what some of the things they're doing. And so um, we want to encourage you to, um, if you have somebody that you know that has kids or a family that, that possibly, you know, might be interested in coming to church, this is the Sunday to invite them to, to kind of showcase some of the things we're doing. And uh, we look forward to that as well. Um, our Bible study is still going on, 6.30, Thursdays at 6.30s. It's not too late to get started. A big one for us is uh, tonight we're having a huge harvest party with our junior senior high tonight. Uh, we're leaving here today at 1.30, I believe it is. Right? Meeting, here. Meeting here at 1.30. We're going out to Jason and Christy Biles for a big harvest party. Um, Tolan and Jen are uh, going to be out there, and they're going to be doing lots of things with us, so we're looking forward to that as well. Um, and then on Halloween night, next Sunday night, we're going to have the, a bounce house out here. We're giving away hot dogs and hot chocolate and full-size candy bars to kids. So tell kids about it. Have them come by. Uh, we got lots of candy. We've had lots of people donate, and we're really appreciative of that. So thank you for um, giving to that as well. Um, Adults, too. What? Adults, too. Yeah, adult, adults can come by, too. And there's also opportunities to serve if you want to serve as well. If you want to come and sit for an hour or something like that, pass out some hot dogs, I'm sure there's opportunity for that as well. We so um, we appreciate you coming by and do that. Jason says he wants to jump at the bounce house. He wants to come for the bounce house? Okay. You, I mean, I guess you could play if you want to, so. Um, the last thing I want, to, I want to keep reminding you of is we have... Uh, this Sunday, next Sunday, we have three Sundays left before uh, shoeboxes are due. Um, you know, sometimes we wonder how we can make an impact in the world as a small church here in Fort Benton, Montana. You know, some of us maybe have dreamed about going on a mission trip or something like that, or maybe we've never had the opportunity to, and how we can impact the foreign world, so to say. And if you've ever thought like that, this is a huge opportunity to present the gospel in countries that that we can't get into. Samaritan's Purse has uh, out, long outreaching arms and they get into places that people aren't allowed to go into. And each shoebox, I wanna, I wanna reiterate this, this is so important, each shoebox has the gospel message about Christ's love for them in their language in each shoebox. And they actually go through, I was, as you'll see, I think on the video, I do have a video this week, thanks to my tech team, they reminded me, I did have a video prepared, um, but I think they do a, a kind of a study with them too, like a week-long study with them as well. But I'll let the video do the talking, but if there's still opportunity to get shoeboxes, you see we still have 24 shoeboxes left to take. We've only, a little over half uh, have been taken. And listen, I know this is a tough year, okay? This is not the time for the church to retreat and not be generous, Okay. And we might have to cut some places in, in our lives in order to present the gospel beyond our borders, okay? And I'm, not, I, I'm, not, and I'm in the same position, okay? This is a tough year for a lot of us, okay? Inflation is through the roof. We're wondering about gas prices, different things like that that, that we're kind of looking at, projecting in the future, okay? But this is not the time for the church to shy away from being generous. This is the time for the church to shine Jesus, to the whole world, okay? So that's my encouragement to you. Um, I want you to know that my family and I, we do we do five boxes. We, we really trim our Christmas budget for this. And that's just something that we do because each one of us want to do a box for a different kid, okay? And so that's your opportunity. We, we give you the shoe boxes. And each shoe box is a pamphlet on how to pack it on which child you're giving to, a boy or a girl, and what age group it's in. It actually tells you how to pack it. And if you wanted more information, you can go to website, their website and see. It gives you an expanded list on how to pack a shoebox and what to pack in it, okay? So that's that. That's my spiel. You can pick them up after church if you would like. There's, Like I said, there's 24 left. I would love for you to be a part of that. And they're due back here on November 14th.
okay? There's still plenty of time. But I want you to see this video and see the out, outreaching impact that, that these shoeboxes have, that, that your ministry has. The joy of seeing a child open the boxes for the first time is just, it's incredible. There's squeals and screams, and they're so excited to see what's inside their boxes. Every shoebox gives a represents the love of God to them. We are so excited. Many of us have visited shoebox for the first time in life. We're here with Operation Christmas Child. The kids are so excited. We have the opportunity to hand out some of the boxes. There's so much joy, so much happiness. And it gives us an opportunity to present the gospel. We pray that these boxes will be used to bring a lot of happiness and joy, but more importantly, the gospel to each part, all these little children around the world. What a great gift. I get a present, I get to know who Jesus is, but not only that, I get to be discipled in his ways. Hundreds of thousands of volunteers work with Operation Christmas Shelf every year, preparing these boxes, praying for the boxes, that God will use them in a mighty way for his glory. This little shoebox has the opportunity to change the world. Not only are they going to get a shoebox, they're going to get the love and the message of Jesus Christ. Some go by helicopter, some go by ship, some go by camel, donkeys, canoes. We go at great lengths to take these boxes to children in the most remote parts of the world. And it's an incredible journey. After these children open the box, they have the opportunity to go through the greatest journey, the 12 lesson discipleship program, where they get to learn more about Jesus Christ. Right now, I'm right outside of Mazlan, Mexico, about six hour drive up in the mountains. This is an indigenous people group, people that never heard the gospel before. The kids and the families that accepted Christ, almost a hundred all together, have now started a church. Hemos visto una experiencia preciosa, grande, ¿verdad? en el pueblo. Y ese pueblo va a ser el medio para llevar el Evangelio a otro lugar. Que estas bendiciones que son de las cajitas sigan llegando hacia arriba. Y ya está. This shoebox gives us an opportunity to continue to shine the bright light of the gospel in the darkest and remote places around the world. We're seeing families come to know Jesus. Churches are sprouting up in these communities. These children are rising up to be disciples in their own country. The gift box and the gospel of Jesus Christ bring hope to our children to bring the smiles back on their faces. No greater need and no greater time than right now for us to go out and serve hope. <laughs> This is what these shoe boxes are all about, to go out and bring the hope of Jesus Christ around the world. I'm just so amazed at what God does each and every year. This is an opportunity to impact the lives of millions of children, just like you've seen. But we need more boxes for next year. Every box is an opportunity for us to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. So thank you, and God bless each and every one. You know, I hear that, and I hope you hear it too. The shoebox that you pack allows the gospel light of Jesus to go into the darkest, most remote places in the world. The shoebox that you can pack. And I, I don't know, it's a, it's a big deal. The gospel of Jesus is a big deal to me. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be up here if it wasn't, obviously. So that's the impact that the shoeboxes can have. And so I hope you'll join us in, in blessing those kids around the world. So will you pray with me as we continue our worship this morning? God, I just come to you to thank you so much for this day. And thank you for the opportunity, Lord, to be together as family, Lord, to worship, to come to your throne, Lord, and to lay it at, all at your feet to say thank you for the cross. Thank you for the resurrection where we come to this place as individuals, but Lord, we come together as family. 
So I thank you for that. I thank you that we have the opportunity to be here to worship freely. Lord, that you allow gifted people to lead us in song. That you have people behind the scenes that are volunteering, Lord. That you have, that you have an opportunity for us to come and sit at your table and commune with you, Lord. Thank you for that. Lord, I pray that you would just be with us now and help us to, to not just be consumers, Lord, that we would be go out and we would produce a product, Lord, for you, that we would shine the light in this community. Lord, help us to live for you in all that we do and to preach the word wherever we go and help us to have an answer for the hope that we have. Lord, fill, fill us up this day. It's in Jesus' precious holy name I pray. Amen. Please stand as we continue our worship.
to them through because I'm not being able to go down and be with them. So we've been praying for Lois's family in Arkansas. They've kind of had a big split over some things. And um, her son has now back with the family. And they're all kind of getting along. But there's still a little bit of turmoil ahead with some court stuff that from the from the boyfriend, I think it was. Or the, boyfriend. Yeah. So we still be praying for that situation. But the prayers have worked. I, Lois called me on... Monday or Tuesday, I don't know. Monday morning. I think yeah, was she was all excited to let me know that, that Patrick was back in the fold again. So I was happy to hear that for her, and um, I'm glad to hear that today. So, But keep praying for that family. It's the Poteet family. Any others? I've got tests on Tuesday. Tests for on your lymph nodes? Yep. Okay, be praying for Lois Tuesday. She has her lymph node tests. Okay. Anything else? Okay. Yes. I have a prayer. The test. Katie and Tyler will be talking here. <laughs> coming to your home. Coming to Friday. Fantastic. Roger Johnson is in the hospital in Great Falls with pneumonia. Roger Johnson. Be praying for Roger Johnson to, to get through that and be healthy. Anything else? Yes, ma'am. Diane. Well, I just think I need to apologize to anybody Thursday if I offended anyone. I did not mean to do that. The other thing is, after reading the thank you article from the two New York people, we aren't all evil yet, at least in Montana. And yesterday I went and spent a little time with Betty Hankins on her. They were celebrating her 90th birthday, so that was very nice. Fantastic. Okay. Uh, was our hand that went up over here? No. Okay, is there anything? Yes, sir, Tola. Uh, Terry and Rocks are headed back to Iowa today and tomorrow. We'll say travels for them. And then we really need to be praying for some rain. We need rain. Yes, we do. It's pretty dry out there. Anything else? When is that? Because it got delayed. That's right. It got delayed a little bit. Jason Worrell, that is uh, Jay and Phyllis' uh, son who lives in Missouri. Um, he's having a kidney transplant, so on November 8th. Anything else? Okay, will you pray with me? God, I just come to you again to thank you so much for this time that we have to, to come before your throne, Lord, and together as family worship. Lord, I, I thank you that we have an opportunity to to do that, Lord, still, uh, Lord, I thank you for the freedom to do that. Father, I thank you for answering the prayers um, for the Poteet family thus far. Um, Lord, I ask that you continue to be with them. Thank you for bringing them back together. Um, Lord, thank you for, I hate to say it, but in, in a bad way, but eliminating the thing that was causing it, Lord. Um, even though there were some bad situations there, Lord, I, I know that you continue to work in that situation and as court dates come up for, for what has happened, I pray that you would be with that family in that situation. And for Lois, as she has tests coming up on Tuesday, uh, be with her, Lord, and help her not to worry. Help her, help her just allow the doctors to do what they need to do. Lord, we're thankful to hear about um, Katie and Tyler traveling over here and I'm going to spend a few days with Ray and Tanya. Um, Lord, I'll see friends and other family members. And so I thank you for that. Pray that you just give them safe travels as they come and uh, for that time that they have to, to make it um, uh, meaningful, Lord. Um, so thank you for that. Lord, I pray that you'd be with Roger as he is in the hospital right now with pneumonia. And I pray that you'd help him to have a full recovery and pneumonia.
pneumonia is difficult, Lord, so um, I pray that you'd be with him and help the doctors and the nurses to treat him well and give him some supernatural um, divine inspiration in his lungs, Lord, to help him to heal. Father, we're thankful to hear about Betty's 90th birthday party, and Lord, I, I, there's just a lot, lot of things that go on in this world, and, and to see someone make it to 90, Lord, is a joyous thing, and so I thank you for that. Lord, I know that there are sometimes things that are said and done, and um, I thank you for uh, Diane being willing to apologize, Lord, and thank you for that. And um, Lord, I pray that whatever it is, Lord, that we would let the peace of you rule in our hearts, no matter what. No matter what we feel about anything going on in this world, whether it's political, whether it's health, whether it's whatever it is, Lord, I pray that you let your peace rule in our hearts over everything else. And Lord, that you would cause unity and not that, that you would not allow division to creep up in our in our hearts and in our souls, Lord. Keep that, keep that junk away. Keep us free from that. And Father, I just ask that as we continue to study your word on Thursday nights, that you would continue to be with us and, and be in there and help us to, to um, learn and be blessed because of it. Father, I pray for safe travels for Terry and Roxy. And I thank you for their vacation and their trip as well, that, they, that it would be, has been good. Lord, and I pray for that, that much needed moisture that we need. Um, Tolan says rain, I, I say snow. So Lord, uh, I pray that you, whatever kind of moisture that you would bring, that you would bring it and, and wet our grounds because we're desperate. It's, it's getting pretty dry out there and some of our seed might not take, Lord. And so I ask that you would be with those seeds that are in the ground and help our farmers to, to get by. And the, Father, the, the little moisture that we had the other day might, might be a, enough um, for now. So thank you for that little bit that we had here in town. I don't know if they had it out in the countryside where they need it the most, Lord, but um, you, you know what you're doing. And so we trust in your plans and we trust in your goodness. Father, I ask that lastly that you would be with Jason as his day uh, as quickly approaching. Um, November 8th is right around the corner. And so Lord, we lift him up to you. We lift his body to be strong to you. We ask that you would help his body to be strong. Or the, those kidney transplants can take a number on, on the, the donor and the, the person receiving, Lord. So I ask that you would be with both of them. Be with those staff, be with those nurses, be with the doctors, be with the aftercare. Father, and I pray that, that Jason's body would not reject the kidney, that it would accept it, and he would get back to a normal way of life for him, Lord. So I know it's been difficult the last few years. So just be with him, be with the family. And Lord, we thank you so much for for answering us and, and hearing our prayers and, and going before us and knowing what's best for us. Father, that the, you would accomplish your will through us. So, Father, I thank you for that. And I thank you again for your son, Jesus Christ. It's his name we pray. Amen.
time once again. One of the things that I think I am so thankful for is this Holy Word of God is mine. It's given me. Everything in here changed to me. And scriptures seem to become old friends. They seem to mean more and more as we study them and learn them. They are something that we can go back to and lean upon them and draw the strength from them. From. A scripture that I'm, I've come to rely upon is in John 14, verse 6. Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. It says so much, but yet it is so simple. Jesus is the answer. Without him, we are a lost people. We have nothing. Nothing to look forward to. Nothing to live for. And I am the way, he says. Beginning that night, Jesus was born that night. And it was the beginning. We had to have that to start with. The truth. God had foretold that he would send a Savior for the world. For us. Each and every one of us. And the life. That is for a special thing for us. Life eternal. And we are joined with Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. And it all happens when we join with him. When he, when we allow him to become our Lord and our Savior. I hope that each and every one of you reconnects with Jesus every time we partake of this communion. I hope it means that much to you. That when we partake of the cup and the bread, we feel it. We're laughing. And it's such a wonderful, meaningful thing to be able to do it every Sunday. It never gets old. And I hope it does it for you. Because of what it represents. Our Lord and our Savior. Dying upon that cross. Taking our sins. Giving us life eternal. The way, the truth, and the life. Do we see bread and juice? Or do we see the blood? in the broken body of the Lord. Can you pray with me?
as we partake this day. Look to your hearts. Allow Jesus to truly be loved. Join me. Heavenly Father, glory be to you for sending us our Lord and our Savior. What a wondrous thing you did. What a lost person I would have been. Hopeless. Without hope. And yet, because of our Lord and our Savior, I am a saved person. Each and every one here who's accepted Him as our Lord and Savior knows that feeling. It fills me with joy and wonder to know where I will be in heaven with you, with my Lord. Father, as we partake this day, as I partake, I do remember my Lord and our Savior. And I thank you, and I thank him for what was done, what is done every day of my life. And I thank you for your holy word that I can go to, to draw strength and encouragement, to draw those things that I need every day. Father, as we partake of these emblems, help us to remember the blood and the broken body upon that cross. Father, we love you. We love our Lord and our Savior. Help us to serve him every day. In your name I pray. Amen.
morning again. It's so dry around here that bread dust is choking me up, so. Man, I needed to drink water or something. Oh, let me open in a word of prayer. God, I just come to you again to thank you for this day and thank you for the opportunity to be here together. Lord, I pray that you would use this time of learning, of, of, of teaching, Lord, that you would use me as an instrument to communicate your word. Move me out of the way, Lord. Speak to our hearts and our minds to what you tell us this day. Lord, thank you for loving us and thank you for Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. So, how often do we not enjoy the moment, a moment that we're in because we're focused on something else? Think about it in your life. Worry moves us away from being present, being in the now, they say. I don't know, do they say that anymore? Maybe I'm too old. But you know, when we're worried about tomorrow's meeting or we're worried about how we're going to pay that bill, and we're at this, at this event, and we're at this fun event, and, and all we're doing is sitting there worrying about that. We're not with our family, we're not with our friends. We're not really enjoying it because we're somewhere else, right? Anybody, anybody ever had that happen in their life? Can you testify with me? Thank you. The be here now mindset is, is, allows us to make the most of our opportunities, right? But if I'm worried, I can't enjoy. Thank you, Rita. Appreciate that. Look at that. <laughs> Get rid of that dry bread dust. Thank you. You know, when, when we're worried, we simply can't enjoy that moment, okay? And let me ask you this. What does worry accomplish us? None. In fact, doctors will tell you that worrying too much will give you ulcers, right? I've heard that before. Yeah. Uh -huh. So if it does nothing for us, what's it do to us then? It robs us. It robs us of joy. It robs us of, of God's peace. It, it robs us of our ability to trust and rely on God. It robs our, our ability to think rationally and actually find solutions to our problems. It steals our patience in waiting for God to move in His perfect timing. Let me say that again. It steals our patience in waiting for God to move in His perfect timing. And then you're going to sit there and you're going to go, well, Kate, okay, you don't know what it's like. Let me tell you a little bit about my life, okay? When I was 18 years old, my mom lost her job at the apartment complex that we were living in. I had to move into my car because I was not moving with them the, the second semester of my senior year to a new school. And I was going to stay at my current high school. And so I made the choice to move into my car. I worked about 10 hours a week at a grocery store. That was about all I could do with school. People didn't know I lived in my car. I spent a time there where, where I wondered what I'm going to eat. Because mind you, my car was a 1986... I forget what kind of car it was now. <laughs> Cutlass Supreme Brome, that's what it was. Okay, 1986 Cutlass Supreme Brome had a 305 in it, and it drank as much oil as it did gas, okay? <laughs> so about every gas tank, it was two quarts of oil, okay? So I was spending all my money on gas and oil for this car that I was sleeping in. But you're going to go, Kit, well, you had a car. Yeah, I did have a car, and then I paid $500 for it. Back when you get cars for $500, Okay. <laughs> But I lived in my car. I had my, my dirty clothes. I had my, my sleeping bag. I didn't know where I was going to take a shower. I didn't know where I was going to find food to eat. I didn't even know where I would sleep in a parking lot that night. Okay? And I worried a lot. I worried so much it made me sick that I worried about it. I learned a long time ago, folks, that worry does nothing but rob, rob God of what he wants to do in your life. Okay? I so, so to say, I slayed this demon years ago. Okay? 
And, and we wonder why Jesus says, don't worry. Let's see what he says in Matthew chapter 6, verse 25 through 34. As we continue our Living Our Best Life series. He says, therefore, we'll talk about that. Remember, therefore is, we've got to find out what it's there for. Okay, we'll talk about that. We've been talking about it. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life. What you will eat or drink or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or stow away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. They do not labor or spin, yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you? You of little faith. So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Jesus says, do not worry. That's the first thing. If you're, if you're a note taker and you want to write it down, do not worry. You see, Jesus says, therefore, he, 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 so what, what is he doing? That therefore, he's connecting the previous verses that, that about focusing on not building up those treasures. You know, he just said, be generous. Make those treasures store up in heaven. Don't, don't store the treasures down here where, they, where moth and rust destroy. Be generous. Live a life that, that, that God wants you to live. And generosity is involved in that. You don't have to worry about it. One of the reasons that, that we get so focused on building up treasure on earth is because I'm worried about keeping or getting the things I have or need in the future. And Jesus simply says, do not worry about those things. And if you notice in the scripture, clothes and food, right? Most basic things there are, right? Clothes and food, think about it. Okay? Basic things. Why? Because we can't manage without food and clothing. We need food and water to live. And nobody wants to be walking around naked, right? Right? So Jesus then asks two rhetorical questions. He says, isn't life more important than food and body more important than clothes? What does he mean by this? We wonder. What could be more important than having the basic, most, basic, most, uh, most, I can't, I can't speak today, most basic necessities? What's more important than that? He's talking about our spiritual lives. Okay. Our lives are more than just the physical folks. And as Christians, we're supposed to believe this. We should believe this. That our lives are more than just physical, that they're spiritual. Our bodies are more than what we put on them. And if we're so worried about food and clothes, think about the people that are, are focused on those things. Think about, think about what they, they toil and torment over in this life. And I'm not saying that we don't like going out and spending money on clothes and food, because we do, right? But Jesus doesn't want us to worry about them, or where they'll come from, or how we'll get them. Even if we don't know where our next meal will come from, or even if we don't know where our next shower, or our next clean set of clothes will come from. He doesn't want us to worry about that. Maybe we, we are, are the kind of family that lives month to month and we get to the end of the month and our fridge is empty. Can't we find ourselves worried about something like that? We could easily find ourselves uh, 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 putting ourselves in a bunch of turmoil because of it. 
And we think about winter and, and how, how quickly it's coming up on us. And, and we think, well, maybe I don't have the right clothes. Maybe I need to do, maybe, maybe I, well, I don't know how I'm going to do it. I, I can't even afford to pay my bills. Blah, blah, blah. You know, we go on and on and on about this. But Jesus wants us to not worry about those things. And he, and he even, even says, gives us examples in Scripture. When he's led out into the desert in Matthew 4, and, and he's led by the Spirit and tempted by the devil. And, and the devil comes to him and says, look, I know you need to eat. I know you're hungry. And if, if, if you're the son of God, turn, out, turn those rocks into bread, right? He says. And what did Jesus say? Man does not live on what? Bread alone. Bread alone but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. You see, we're more than physical, folks. And Jesus is trying to get us to see that. Jesus is trying to get us to see that our flesh is temporary and the spirit is eternal. Sure, we need things to survive physically, okay? We understand that. But Jesus is saying, don't worry about it. We can think, we can think about them we can, we can actually prepare for things, and I'm not saying that's wrong either. But when you go to that place where you're obsessing and, you're, and, you're, and you're, your joy is being robbed of it, and you're, you're letting it steal your patience on God's timing, it's unhealthy. And that anxiety that you can get from it is terrible. Because what these people were going through back then was very similar to what Jesus is describing. It was a very harsh and savage environment that they lived in. They were obligated to give so much money to the temple that they didn't know sometimes how they were going to feed their families. Some people lived so far out sometimes that when their, their, their grains and their oils ran out, they had no idea what was going to happen. So they would venture into town and hoping that God would do something. That God would, would do something, but these people find themselves worrying about it. God gives us an example in Scripture as well about not worrying about it. You know those, those, those people called the Israelites, God's people? They wandered around in the desert for 40 years, and they didn't know what they would eat day to day. And God gave them manna every day. They would, they would eat the, the food that was dropped to the ground, and when it was gone that night, they just hoped that God would bring more food back. And, and even when some got worried about it, it was like, well, we're not sure if God's going to provide again. They would store up extra, right? Scripture tells us that that would turn to maggots. God was taking care of them. God was allowing his timing to come through. And when they got thirsty... He made water come out of rocks. Their clothes, 40 years in the desert. Don't you think people's clothes would fall apart? But not once in Scripture does it say anything about their clothes falling apart. God took care of them. And you might be sitting there again going, well, kid, that's the Old Testament, right? And I would tell you this. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights who does not change like shifting shadows. We can look at what God did for a bunch of complaining Israelites and realize that he will take care of us too. We are all here today because God has taken care of us. <clears throat> How many times have we worried about a situation and then God provided? What that worry do for you? How many times were you worried in the scenario, scenario that we conjured up in our heads? never really happened. What did that worry do for you? I try to remind us all the time and myself that hindsight is a gift each one of us has been given by God to look back and see how God has brought us through each and every time. I think about my time that I, I, I lived in my car and how, what God did for me through that. He, he, he opened avenues and he, and he allowed me to get in trouble so that people would notice and I didn't, like, I didn't like it at the time, and I got help. People opened up their homes to me. My best friend and my youth minister opened up their homes to me. 
And I see what God did through that. And God does that for every single one of us. When we worry about what's going to happen, and yet that does nothing for us except, except steal what God is doing for you. Steals that joy. And so Jesus says, he says, don't worry about your life. He in fact says, who by worrying, you? What, what can you do? You can add time to your life. Not like add years, but you'd actually take time off of your life. <coughs> and I'll tell you, it seems natural. The older we get, the, the, the more worry we have about life. Our health, you know, our grandkids, our kids, you know. Living in an, in an upper age bracket, you can you be a little nerving because you might go to the doctor and they might say something. They might give you a, a diagnosis that you're worried about. Maybe it was a, a serious accident where you thought you should have died, but you didn't. And you might still be sitting there worried about those kinds of things and, well, I don't know. But Jesus says, who by worrying can add a single hour to his life? And I'm not going to say that a, a health diagnosis or a car crash or something like that won't grip us with fear. It seems to be natural sometimes, but, but what I would ask you, what do you do with that fear and that worry? Do you turn to God and give it to Him? Because I'll tell you what, worry does not help. Worry takes time off our lives, Jesus says. And he says, don't worry about your life. And I'm telling you, any part of it. It's not just the end. But it's everything from the time we were born till we see Jesus face to face. You know, Jesus mentions only food and clothing. But how easily could we include everything else too? Don't worry about that job interview. Don't worry about that bill. Don't worry about that trip. Don't worry about that upcoming event. Don't worry about that family situation. Don't worry about that health diagnosis. And so on and so on. We could go on and on, right? When we worry, we are essentially removing God out of the equation. We're thinking we alone need to handle this. We need to bear the burden. And then that God's got enough problems. But can I tell you that worry makes our problems bigger than our God? When we try to wrap around it and hold on to it and say, no, i got to worry about this, God. We make the worry bigger than God is. So you might wonder, what am I supposed to do then? Jesus gives us two examples. He says, consider the birds and the lilies, or the grass. Consider the birds, the flowers, or whatever, however your translation says it. First one, he says, look at the birds in the air. They don't sow or reap or store up, do they? But God still feeds them. The birds might not sow or reap, but that doesn't mean God just drops it in their laps either, okay? They still have to fly and hunt their prey. But God provides a way for them, right? He shows them where to find the food. He gives them the instinct to do it. And since they don't store their food, what do they got to do? They got to rely on God. And it's obvious that God is providing for them, right? You looked outside lately? There's birds everywhere, right? You see, God is the one who gives the wild creatures their food, yes. <coughs> But they still need to hunt and find it. They still got to go out and get it. But God allows them the, the abilities to do that and have that there. Likewise, think about our lives. When we're in need, do we trust God to provide for us? That's the question we need to ask ourselves. It doesn't lend us to be lazy. We still might have to get out there and work for it, okay? But... We're much more valuable than those birds. We're much more valuable than those animals to God. We are the crowning creative achievement of God. We are meant to rule over the beasts of the earth and the fish in the sea and the birds of the air. That's the directive God gave us. 
We are the crowning achievement. How much more does God care about us than them? Look at the flowers of the field, the grass of the field. God knows what it is. God knows how beautifully it's dressed. He said, I love what he says. Not even in all of Solomon's splendor was it dressed like that. You see, we have to understand that God will provide for us. And worrying does nothing for us except add hours away from our life. Look what he says. You have little faith. That's kind of a... Uh, oh, oh. Punching the ribs, right? And you wonder, you know, he highlights it as a faith issue at various times, and we see that. And he actually describes, he uses this phrase to describe the shortcomings of his followers. In Matthew 8, the disciples were in a boat, and the storm blew through, and Jesus was asleep in the front of the boat on a cushion, and, and they got up, like, ah, don't you care? And he turns to them and says, You have little faith, why are you, why are you so afraid? Mind you, they had just seen Jesus do miraculous things before that. In Matthew 14, the disciples, Jesus came out to his disciples walking on water, right? Remember that? And they say, if it's you, tell us to come out. Come on. Peter looks at, looks, looks at the things around him, the waves and the wind, and, and he starts to sink. And Jesus pulls him out and puts him in the water and goes, man, you have little faith. Why? Why did you doubt? Why did you worry about the storm? I'm right in front of you. Jesus says, I'll be with you always to the very end of the age. Folks, as Christians, he's with us. It's easy to be afraid and to worry and to doubt. It is. Because you look at the world out there, it can be a scary place, can it not? The things that are happening in our world can be so daunting sometimes. But when we worry, when we worry, we're not putting our faith in the one who made all of this. When we worry, we're taking God out of the situation and saying our worry is bigger than him. And we need to remember to have that hindsight in those situations. We need to remember the times when God provided us for us before. And stronger faith results in less worry, fear, and doubt, folks. It does. I, I, I could be a testimony to that. If we're not supposed to worry about how God will provide, so what do we do then? What is my overall mission or goal then? In Matthew chapter 6, verses 31 through 34 says, do not worry, saying, what shall you eat, what shall you drink, what shall you wear? For the pagans run after all of these things. And your heavenly Father knows that you need them. And here it is. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. The pagans run after these things. Jesus is telling us not to behave like those who don't know who God is. You see, when we run around worrying and fearing and doubting, we're not being a very good witness for Jesus. When those who don't know Christ chase after all the things of the world, it's understandable. They don't have any hope. They don't know where to turn. They don't know where to go. They don't know any better. And it makes sense when those who don't have access to that kind of peace and joy of Christ, how they act. But folks, as a Christian, we do. But when Christians do these things, it doesn't make any sense. We know the maker of life. We know the provider of life is God. We have seen the power of God in our lives. You might have even seen miraculous work in your life through what God has done. So there's no, really no reason to worry or doubt. We know better, we've seen better, and we have the power to do better. Remember what, what 
Peter says about this. He says, cast all your anxiety on him because why? He cares about you. In Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 and 30, Jesus says, come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light, in verse 30. When we know and are convinced that God loves us and cares about us, we can find that freedom from worry. God wants to give us things that don't worry us. God wants us to, to not worry about those simple things. And here it is. If you've ever wanted to know the meaning of life, it's right there in verse 33. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Stop worrying, Jesus says. Because all that other stuff that you're worried about, if you come to me first and follow me first, I'll give it all to you. Do what's right. You see, worry makes us impatient and demanding and oftentimes critical. Sometimes when we're frustrated with God about our prayers not being answered, it's because we're worried about him, we're anxious, and we want to get ahead of him. You see, Paul even writes about that in Philippians. In Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7, he says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, pray and petition, and with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And what's that? And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Folks, when we let go of that worry and that anxiousness and that fear and that doubt, and we say, you know what, God, I want to do what you want me to do. I, don't, I might not know where my next meal is coming from. I might not know about my health diagnosis. I might not know about this or that. But I give it to you, and I leave it up to you. Just use me for your kingdom. Man, I don't know about you, but when I did that, it's like this warm, fuzzy feeling came over me. It was like this, this, God just filled me up. And I still thank him for that time that I had where I learned this lesson. It wasn't a very fun few months that I lived in my car. I'll tell you that. It wasn't. But God has used that to grow me into who I am today. He, he's, he's allowed me not to worry about the things of this life. And to be more generous, to, to build treasures up in heaven rather than treasures here. I'll close with this. You know, we get worried and upset about a lot of things. But, but are we taking the time to be with Jesus? Are we more worried about what's going on in our lives than spending time with Jesus? If we would turn that worry and that focus over to Jesus and focus on Him, you know what you find? You find that warm fuzziness. And you know what that warm fuzziness is? It's the peace of God. And we will be able to, when, when things come our way, guess what? We'll start putting things in perspective. We'll start seeing them and we'll go, you know what? I don't got time to worry about that. God, you got it. You see, when we worry about things, we're not producing the fruit that God wants for us. But when we slow down, and when we take time to spend time with Jesus and give that worry over to him, he gives us that peace and we can start doing that kingdom work. But seek first his kingdom. Remember he just prayed your kingdom come? That's a part of that. I'll tell you what, things may still need to get done. But when you worry about them, there's no point in it. You look at this big long list of things you might have to do and you're just going, oh. I would tell you not to become overwhelmed. Because if you're thinking about the whole thing, 
yeah, it's going to overwhelm anybody, right? But you start taking those things one thing at a time. You settle down and start taking them one thing at a time. Maybe before you go into it, you pray about it. God, give me the strength to do this thing. And I'll tell you what, a lot of things can get done that way. This word worry is derived from an old Anglo-Saxon word meaning to strangle or to choke. How well named is that? Right? Because that's what worry does to us. It, strang it puts a stranglehold or a chokehold on us. And, 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 and what, what a normal, sensible situation might be, it turns it into a, a blown up thing. Mountain out of a molehill, I've heard it said a lot. So I tell you, from God's word, do not worry. And it accomplishes nothing. Because tomorrow has enough trouble of its own. Doesn't it? Don't let worry rob you of joy in the kingdom work God has for you. Don't let it. Don't let worry do that to you. Because that's all it's doing is robbing you. It's putting that stranglehold or that chokehold on your life. Pray with me. God, I just come to you to thank you so much for this day. Lord, I thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you for the lessons that you've taught me. Even though they're difficult lessons, Lord, I thank you that I've crossed that bridge. And I, and I have the experience, Lord, and the maturity to, to when things arise in my life still to this day that I turn to you. Father, maybe we're not all there yet. But I pray that you would help us as Christians to not worry. Lord, let us not worry about the situations that we're in, but to, to, to push forward, Lord. Keep moving forward. Lord, help us to turn it over to you. Thank you, Lord, that we don't have to worry about eternity. Thank you, Lord, that we don't have to worry about where our food comes from. Thank you that we don't have to worry about what clothes we're going to wear. Thank you for taking care of us, Lord. Thank you for taking care of our eternity through Jesus Christ. Thank you for taking care of our food and our clothes. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to live our best life and not to let our, our lives be robbed or choked out because of worry. Give us the strength to rise above it. It's in Jesus' holy name I pray. Amen. Our music team is going to come forward this morning, and they're going to play an invitation song. You might want to talk about something. You can come talk to me about it now. You can talk to me after church. But the thing I don't want you to, to miss is the peace of Jesus Christ. When you know Jesus Christ, that peace transcends all understanding. The joy that is brought up in your life. And you can live your best life before others and point people to Jesus. If you don't know Jesus or you don't have a relationship with him and you want to talk about this, that this day, come talk to me. And we'll, we'll get her squared away, hopefully. Let's stand and let's sing.
God, I just come to you again to thank you for the opportunity to be here together with family, Lord, that we might go out from here and point people to you. May we have an answer for the hope we have. Let us, let us live our life the best we can. Let us not worry. Lord, let, us, let it not rob us of the joy you have for us and allow us to be an effective kingdom worker for you. So Jesus precious, the holy name I pray. Amen. Thank you for being here today. Um, if you want to grab a shoebox on your way out, please feel free to do so. And uh, get that filled up. Get back here by the 14th. Have a great week. Love God, love others. Okay.